today we have Grant Vandenbush um, from Fifth Season, Chris Higgins from Hort Americas, and um, Matt Gabori from Calix King. Um, they'll each be talking about um, issues that they see in the market right now, and then how um, futuristic solutions um, can can meet those um, issues and and needs of the customer. Hi, so I'm Grant Vandenbush. Uh, I, sp I spoke earlier. Um, just a, another quick piece of background on me. So I was at General Mills for a little over five years. Um, a large portion of that time I spent um, uh, working on the energy risk management strategy for General Mills, looking at a lot of distributed energy platforms, looking at a lot of co-generation systems, um, as well as how we thought about our, our both our diesel, natural gas, and electricity uh, risk programs. So um, when I when I joined Fifth Season, um, I think as I mentioned earlier, we had a, a very tiny. Uh, farming technology system and and we knew that our whole thesis was to try and pull the labor out of the out of the growing and, and we knew that once we did that that energy would be the largest cost so we tried to be very thoughtful about how we built energy solutions into our growing platform and um, so, some of what I'm going to share with you today is is actually how we've did, done that and how we've set ourselves up to to optimize energy over the long term so um, I, I, I certainly want to go into that um, I'll try and be, be brief about it. Um, so, so this is our facility. Uh, this is the, the facility that is coming online right now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have uh, products uh, on shelves within the next um, 30 to, to 45 days. This is in a steel town uh, called Braddock. That is the, it's called US uh, Edgar Thompson Steel. That's actually Andrew Carnegie's former uh, manager. Uh, it's where he invented the Braddock Press, which ultimately made him a, a little bit of cash. Um, so it's a 1.5 megawatt facility with human-free, uh, consistent and controlled uh, biodomes. So what's going on underneath the roof there uh, is, is what you're looking at in that, um, actually that's a, a two-scale diagram. Uh, what we have is a, a tray loop system where we've really taken the methodology of an automated fulfillment center and used that as a platform to grow plants. So instead of moving around pallets of boxes, we're moving around uh, pallets of plants. And so as you think about an automated processing, an automated um, growing, an automated harvesting, and an automated packaging system, that's how that moves around in our, our full loop. And we have two biodomes that we have complete control over. So what that means is that um, we can be a lot more precise. Um, so, so from a control standpoint, these are, this is an example of, of one of our panels. We have um, uh, over 100 panels inside of the full system. And then on our breaker, we have high resolution uh, uh, information gathering. And what that allows us to do is, is feed everything into our system. And so when we talk about smart manufacturing, this is really allows us to be better about our scheduling. So with the human free grow rooms, we don't have to wait for a day shift or wait for a night shift in order to move plants around to the optimal space. We don't have to wait for a day shift or wait for a night shift in order to kick on irrigation or kick on fans or even bring things out. Uh, that allows us to be very, very smart around how we schedule and use, use our electricity. So, so it's the combination of these things and then also within the system being able to augment them. Um, so, so from an energy optimization standpoint, um, what, we're, what we're doing is, is we publish grow recipes into our, our software system. So those grow recipes, each, each one of them has uh, an energy assumption and a buffer window for that. And so as we think about filling up that biodome uh, with all of these different individual orders, if you will, that the system then takes care of, the system is re-optimizing to figure out what the ideal energy usage is based on top of that. And then our system is also combining that with our high-res monitoring based on all of the smart panels that we've created to look at and say, okay, if we were planning on using this much energy and our actual energy consumption was this, why is there that variance? And a lot of times, because we have these buffer zones in our grow recipes, what that allows us to do is be smarter about how we, how we use energy. Everything's done to a quality standard, so it's not like we are sacrificing quality on a lot of these things. It's just... Uh, when, we, when we think about blending product together, or we think about creating uh, packages of, of, that come from multiple trays, you might be able to shave an hour here or an hour there when you think about this full, full scheduling problem in, in one instance. 
And then finally, we have a microgrid. So that's really about connecting this entire energy uh, uh, schedule or this entire energy portfolio along with what's happening inside of, inside of the grid or inside of or what's happening locally. So um, this is a microgrid architecture. We work with Scale Microgrid. Uh, they have been fantastic partners. Uh, capital is always a, a struggle when you are a, a young startup. So, you, so Scale Microgrid's innovative platform to, to really reduce that capital requirement has been very helpful to us. Uh, the solar can, can really generate about uh, can really generate a pretty significant amount of electricity for us. It's not, you know, it's not 100% of our, our of our yield or, or sorry of our requirements. And then we also have a standby generator that's fed by NAC gas that can kick on. So the three days of resiliency is huge for us in the event that there is a grid outage. Our neighbors next door, uh, they kind of pull a lot of power and do have a lot of demand uh, and, a, and a lot of say to the utility. Uh, but um, that that capability for us to have the understanding for how we are impacting the grid and the flexibility for how we want to run our operation is huge when you think about curtailment and other types of activities. Um, so we're, we're literally just starting this up. I wish I had actual numbers that I could post on here. This is our, our projected monthly load versus available generation. I absolutely cannot wait until we do have that data and we can share it with you because uh, to my knowledge, we are the, the first real manufacturing process that has dynamic load balancing that we can do inside of a human free operation. So um, I, I just get really, really uh, geeked up about what that can do. Sorry. No, you did great. Yeah, so my name is Chris Higgins. Um, I am the general manager and co-owner of Horde Americas. Horde Americas is a Texas-based company, Dallas, Texas-based company. And what we really are is we're, we're a wholesale supply company. But over the last decade, we've really focused on controlled environment agriculture. And for us, that means anything from a tissue culture facility to an indoor vertical farm to a greenhouse, we work with those growers and helping them develop and implement their ideas, as well as providing with them supplies after they're up and growing. Um, my business partners are from the Netherlands. Um, they are a Dutch grower cooperative with about 125 years of experience. So in essence, my board is made up of about a thousand Dutch greenhouse growers. Uh, so we get a lot of input from the Netherlands and that's shaped a lot of what we've done over the years. Uh, our vision is to be the leading North American uh, wholesale supply company. And that's kind of shifting right now because what we've realized over the years is that many of the growers we're working with today, especially those looking at growing food crops in unique environments, need more than just a supply company. They need a partner. Uh, they need a partner to talk about what others are doing that they find successful, what equipment they may be able to use that they don't have to completely reinvent, um, and other ways of helping them manage costs because many of them are on a very tight budget. And what that causes us to do is link the grower with manufacturers that we vetted and trust. We do have a demonstration greenhouse in downtown Dallas. It's connected with the State Fair of Texas. Uh, so if anybody's ever in Dallas and wants to visit and see uh, seven or eight growing systems right now. I don't know what we have. It's open 365 days a year. It's about 100 yards from the old Cotton Bowl. Um, and during the month of October, we get about 400,000 visitors uh, right now. So it's become kind of an agritourism uh, spot. But in there, you'll see that we, we will run a uh, product demonstration with uh, new products from some of our vendor partners like General Electric, um, Grodan, um, other sensor companies like 30 megahertz. And our, our goal is to figure out that this technology can work, not for the most technical, technologically advanced group of people, but that the average grower can make this equipment work. And you'll find we've had to prove this to ourselves because our growing team consists of the landscapers that run the state fair that's itself. So we have to teach this to a bunch of landscapers who have no horticulture degree, um, would probably be more comfortable driving a lawnmower than you know, calibrating EC and pH. So the way we look at the business is we try to simplify it. Um, there was a question asked about, you know, do they sell weight or do they sell units in the last panel? And I thought the answer was interesting because the units are essentially weight. So for a grower of ours that's growing a head of bib lettuce, we know that there's a certain weight that fills up a clamshell. And we know that there are you know, a handful of clan shells that most of the produce bu uh, buyers want to receive. So they may be selling a unit, 
but inside that unit is a weight that we have to meet. So um, similar to agriculture throughout the years, our growers are dealing with yield. And in order to be profitable, we really have to send, uh, understand those yield uh, economics. Um, and our ability to help those growers be profitable is what's gonna lead to our longevity. So again, we're based in Texas. Um, we service all of North America. Uh, we have customers as far south as Brazil and as far north as Barrow, uh, Alaska, and we do have customers internationally as well. Um, this, this slide just really kind of leads into what I finish up there. We are, you know, we as a company are focused on collaboration, focus and open-mindedness. Um, one of the things we see with the industry is that there are a lot of people that are protecting themselves with a lot of NDAs. Um, if we look at the history of controlled environment agriculture, and we use the Dutch model as maybe a case study. The interesting thing about that model is that they are very open as long as you speak Dutch. Um, but all the greenhouses essentially look the same. And what that means is that those greenhouses, while the systems inside are slightly different, what that means is that their ability to share helps them share the cost. And it helps them build their industry, not only in the Netherlands, but as they export globally. So that's something that we would like to see come to the U.S. and come to North America would be more of an openness of, of sharing what are the best practices and using those best practices to drive our industry forward, not just drive an individual business forward or a, an individual opportunity forward, but to drive the industry forward. Because with that, we will start to change the opportunities that we have in the United States. We will start to possibly manufacture some more stuff here versus just importing everything from either uh, Northern Europe or, or Asia. Um, and again, encouraging everybody to be open and receptive to new ideas is key for, for our company. My name is Matthew Gabori. Uh, I am an owner and operator in the cannabis industry in several different uh, market segments, primarily uh, through Calyx Culture, which is a tissue culture and genetic breeding company, and House of Cultivar, which is a recreational and adult use cannabis brand headquartered in Seattle, Washington, but also with presence in California and hopefully in 2020 in Massachusetts as well. And in addition, uh, my, my desire and passion for sustainability has brought me onto the board of the Resource Innovation Institute as well. I started off about uh, over a decade ago in my basement with one little grow light as a hobby and as a passion. And then quickly it, through um, education and architecture, expanded that out through one grow light to four grow lights, and then I built out my basement, and then a small garage, and then from there a warehouse, and then as the, the medical laws and recreational laws expanded in Washington State, we grew and evolved. And from that first basement to the 50,000 square foot building that we're in now in, in downtown Seattle, there's always been an issue of power. And from a, from a very functional standpoint, no building that we ever started off with had enough power. So it's always been a process of trying to reverse engineer what your outputs are based upon the, the limitations of the grid or your local lo location. So for us, it's always been a very functional requirement to have to be as sustainable as possible. So from that very early instance, about 10 years ago to, to now, we have been constantly trying to evolve the, the technologies. I mean, I remember building LED, getting Cree you know, uh, uh, diodes and building LEDs in my basement, uh, trying to think that it was gonna be the, the revolution, which uh, through you know, companies you know, here today have really taken it to that next level and allowed us to capitalize on those technologies. But what I really wanna talk about today is some of the methodology that goes beyond uh, what you see in, in conventional agriculture and what is specific to, to cannabis. And a big part of that is the product selection. So if any of you have ever been into a, a retail dispensary your storefront, you've noticed the huge selection of different strains and genetics and products that are on the marketplace. And each one of those genetics has a certain requirement for it. And a lot of it comes down to space, um, uh, area, light, water, labor, and supplies and materials. Conventionally, what we have done is we've created mother plants, and then from those mother plants, that mother stock, we've created clones, and then the clones create the production plants, which then create the products. But for every strain, for every different product that you have, that means that you have to keep a mother plant alive to represent and to hold that genetic to create that propagation. That means that a at least one large plant 
is going to be necessary for each one of those things. And that is a light, that is water that goes into that plant, and that's time and labor that those employees spend dealing with it. So for us, what we tried to do was how do we take that and then consolidate that? Because that's how you're going to be the most efficient and that's how you're going to reduce your resource usage. So for us, we, we have uh, spent a lot of time uh, doing a lot of research and development and perfecting the, the art and sciences of, of tissue culture and micropropagation. What micropropagation has allowed us to do is essentially take these large mother plants and the large amount of area and resources and consolidate that into in vitro test tubes and essentially take all of our mother stock and propagation stock that took up about 8,500 square feet in our, in our uh, Seattle facility and consolidate that down to about 1,500 square feet of space. Um, it, has, it has allowed us to, to uh, uh, reduce our load quite significantly, and it, it, it in addition has a lot of uh, operational benefits as well. We have a lot cleaner plant stock, we're able to reduce contamination spread, and we're able to actually have a much more efficient operational process, which reduces costs and resources in the downstream processes through different uh, IPM measures, different technology that a lot of people have to put in place to mitigate stuff and, and contamination and, ne and negative consequences from that that we can get rid of in the tissue culture process. So not only does it consolidate the space, but it also provides for a much more um, streamlined operation downstream. So as I said, we, we converted those, those large mom rooms into the lab space. So this is the example in Seattle of about 8,500 square feet of, of original mom and, and genetic storage space that was taking up, you know, had about 15 tons, tons of HVAC as well, supplying it. We, we had even uh, gone through a lighting rebate and had converted all of our 1,000 watt metal highlight fixtures over to 315, me uh, 315 watt ceramic metal highlight fixtures, but we were still using roughly uh, a little over 100,000 watts. Whereas in the new tissue culture lab, we're down to about 14,000 watts. So as you can see, a significant decrease from 8,500 square feet to 1,500 square feet and from over 100,000 watts to 14,000 watts doing the exact same operational protocol and even expanding our genetic library and storage capabilities. So, you know, as a, as a grower and somebody who's operationally and functionally in, in the marketplace, you know, one thing that I want to try to... Um, express to everybody as we look at the advancements in the industry, it's not only in the technology that's required to do this, but also in the methodology and the approaches. When you go and you visit, you know, grows, you're going to see uh, uh, there's a million different ways to skin the cat. No two, two operations are doing it the same. And I think as we progress and as we advance, we need to start to create some of those standards as we d discussed earlier and start to share resources on how we can change methodologies to then put the proper equipment in place to really see those advancements and those reductions in, in, in resource usage. Thank you. And now we'll take questions. A couple of you mentioned um, proprietary advancements and NDAs as part of um, this work, and I wonder how do we balance those proprietary advancements and NDAs with opportunities that could kind of lift all boats, um, new important ideas for the entire industry, and how do we kind of balance um, those two things? Uh, I'll jump in on this one, and I think it's because we've experienced this so much. I mean, especially in the cannabis side of things, people uh, think that their 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 trade secrets are really their uh, ultimate success factor, which is, in my opinion, what is uh, um, slowing down the progress and even uh, re retarding individual growth in, in a company's business plan and strategy. I really think that uh, through organizations like the Resource Innovation Institute, you know, bringing like-minded individuals together to share really is the best way to, to to um, transcend that. And I think the way that we do that is to show value with the information that's coming out. So I think, you know, through these uh, standard setting groups, uh, getting that information percolated out to the widest audience possible in as uh, cost effective manner, I think is the way in which we, we, we spread it as quickly as possible. And the only thing I would add there is, is making sure you, as a group, we understand what's worth protecting and what has been around for a long period of time. Um, I've been in the industry for about 25 years, and I would say about once a month, I get a phone call from somebody who has a really awesome new idea, and the idea has been around a long time, right? Um, so in a lot of ways, we want to protect, the, the easiest one I've always used is a lot of people want to protect the irrigation system. 
but all we are doing is using irrigation systems that have been around for 30 or 40 years. So, so making sure you, you've done your work, you've done your research, and you understand, okay, am I really doing anything different? Or am I just slightly modifying the way I'm moving water? That that's in itself is not worth protecting. But there are things that are, right? Um, and understanding what those are and how those benefit you and your organization, I think are key in helping move everything forward. Because if you open yourself up a little bit, somebody may have already made all the mistakes that you're getting ready to make. And they can save you a lot of money and time by helping you through those things. Hi, um, I had a question about understanding the incremental cost between what you could have done and the innovative choice that you did choose to do and how you were able to perhaps calculate that yourself and communicate it to your stakeholders, investors, and maybe even the utilities, because oftentimes that's what the utilities want to know in order to incentivize some sort of an inventive or cutting edge technology. So finding out the ROI, knowing the incremental cost between traditional choice versus paving a new path. Yeah, that's a, a, a great question. Thank you for asking that. Gretchen, right? Yeah, thank you for asking that, Gretchen. Um, so uh, let me just talk about our switch gear real quick because uh, when we first looked at doing the switch gear, I think our, our project, our electrical engineer on the project said that that was gonna cost us a million dollars more in capital because our, our uh, sorry, let me talk about our microgrid because he said that, you know, that we had to upgrade the switch gear to be the greatest switch gear that's ever existed before on the planet of Earth or something like that. Um, so, so that was that was a big that was a big hurdle for us. That took some time. Um, you know, the local builder on the project really liked Siemens switch gears, and and for our project, we had to go with a Schneider switch gear. So it was making spending a lot of time with that with that builder, getting them very comfortable with the technology, getting them very comfortable with the install process, getting them very comfortable with the corresponding effect, and making sure that. Um, that I think you asked the commissioning question earlier, uh, getting that, that sequenced into the full commissioning plan and how that would fit and how that would fit with the local utility uh, electrical inspector and, and what, would, what would be that process. Um, so, so that was something that we, we knew that we, we needed to do this and we knew that it was something that had to happen at zero incremental capital to us. And so that was uh, an example of where we relied heavily on external partners uh, to, to come in and sit down uh, and take everybody through via pictures, videos, everything else to get the local constructors, the local builders, the local people unfamiliar with the technology, familiar with everything. So that way we could realize, no, it was not a $1 million incremental switch gear cost. It was actually uh, you know apples to apples. Once you figured it out, it was the exact same switch. So um, that was really big for us. Uh, we also looked uh, pretty significantly at a combined heat and power system. That was a decision we chose not to make. Um, for us at that point in time, um, that was actually looking the other way, looking at some of the phenomenal advisors that we've had on the on the um, HVAC side in terms of how we were thinking about usage. Um, you know, that was just a, it was a little bit too much capital for us at this time, and it was a little bit too much of a, of a slightly potential risk to the commissioning plan that we said, um, you know, no, there's there's enough in this facility already. We don't we don't want to take on that project as well. Um, it, it all comes down to I think both the math problem and and what you you feel comfortable doing. Just to kind of add to that, great comments by the way. Um, it's really just trying to look long term. You know, I, I think like with most. Uh, technologically advanced or sustainable solutions, there's an additional upfront cost associated with it. So really looking at that ROI, not in a short term, one or two years, but more in the, the five to 10 year realm, really makes things pencil out on paper to uh, make a lot more sense. And also when you're, when you're looking at this from a prerogative standpoint, uh, I don't think any of these decisions that we're making are necessarily short-term decisions, whether it be for our business or whether it be for the planet Earth in general from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, for anybody on the panel, can you guys speak a little bit to your experience and what you're seeing right now with respect to water or atmospheric water generation systems? Chris, as you remember, we had a system from a Southern California company called Skywell at Urban Produce, which was a great system, but it was problematic, where we were able to capture about 140 gallons a day. What are you guys seeing in terms of atmospheric water generation systems in pure indoor environments, not necessarily greenhouse, but Grant for you and other gentlemen for you? 
So uh, the biggest ones for us in an indoor environment are the condensation that's coming off of any of your HVAC components, which nowadays with uh, filterization that's out there, it's almost a no-brainer to be able to capture that and put that back into your fertigation. And then uh, for most hydroponic gar gardeners, you know, there is somewhere between a 15 to 25 percent runoff that's typically happening through that flushing process, which, you know, most people right now are, you know, mitigating so that they can put into a sewer system. But there is lots of opportunity to recapture, filter filter and reuse that water as well. Th those, those are the two biggest right now. Yeah, maybe just to add to that uh, real briefly. So we have a, we have a fill and drain system. We, we capture a, a lot of the, of the water that comes out of that. I don't, I don't know the exact percentage. Um, y you know, for us, water is, it's really important, but it's not, it, when, when I think about the hierarchy of, of, of cost and strategies for us it's it's something where it's it's not the top of the list that's prohibiting us from either you know investing immediately in the next project or or it's not it's not on the top of our list for for solutions because we can capture so much of it um, it's important to us as a company because we we think deeply about our our impact to the water cycle and, and what we're doing with nutrient rich water but um, it's it's not as important to us as figuring out the energy uh, usage yeah, and I would, I would add to that, most of the farms that we're working with on the indoor side, right, um, it, is, it, it should be much lower on the priority list because their total water consumption is fairly low, uh, especially on the food producing side. And they're able to recirculate the irrigation system so frequently that they're pretty water efficient. Uh, when we look at the, you know, the bigger customers we have that are using lots of water, um, they have, they're not implementing those systems currently uh, in terms of food producing or flower production. Um, they are more looking at how are they going to capture rainwater? How are they going to be as efficient as they possibly can when it comes to managing their nutrient salts with inside their irrigation system? I think for us, with the majority of the customers we have, it's, it is, okay, where can I have the biggest impact today? And probably in figuring out how to make their nutrient solution go longer by using you know, the right fertilizers and the right measuring and, and sensing equipment is probably a better way for them to, 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 to have a bigger impact on water than it is to capture the atmospheric water. I'll just add, um, we've done some research on water and whether, they're worth, whether it's worth incentivizing um, from a utility perspective. And at least in the Northeast, water is extremely cheap. Um, and plentiful, so um, it's usually not, um, it does not behoove us to look into water incentives, um, but that's very geographically dependent, of course. Um, if you were looking at California, that's very, very expensive um, and important water. So um, that is very geographic, just like um, some states may care more about carbon um, than other states right now. So you'll see those priorities switch depending on where you're at. Um, I've heard a lot about water here, but it's really not a concern of any of our customers in Vermont. Uh, this is for Matt. Matt, I'm curious, I know you travel quite a bit around the country and get a chance to um, attend a lot of cannabis conferences. What would you say is the level of, for lack of a better word, cross-pollination between what we know to be true in cannabis and what more mature ag sector players are doing today? based on you know, multiple years of experience in greenhouse, is there a bigger need for that kind of cross-sector conversation, or are you seeing that happen in other parts of the country? Yeah, a great, great question, John. You know, I think uh, over the last, especially four or five years, as the industry has kind of rapidly uh, grown and evolved, you know, we've seen a lot of crossover, or I like the word cross pollination a lot better, uh, from from uh, you know major ag over to to the cannabis industry, and vice versa. You know, there's been uh, a large amount of, of monetary capital to come into the cannabis industry that has really invoked a lot of innovation that has been stagnant in commercial ag for years. However. Uh, that has also been an Achilles heel of people trying to evolve too quickly and forgetting some of the simple standards of large-scale agriculture as well. So that, that's really where we've seen this um, information pass that's been happening. And for the most part, you know, I think that the scaling and the, the, the large uh, industrial practices of, of ag are starting to be more... Um, 
accepted as cannabis gets to the scale where those things make sense. You know, for a long time, we were at a, a hobbyist or, or commercial scale where some of those large scale methodologies just weren't applicable. But now that, that we're, we're really kind of breaching those, those, those size and, and scale uh, to that, that next level, they're really starting to become applicable. And then combining that with the innovation that's starting to happen, we're really seeing this, this hot pot of, of, uh, of explosive growth. I'd like to also, uh I've got to think about what I want, how I want to say this. Um, I don't want to ostracize myself with a group of people that are looking in, you know, directly at cannabis. Um, Hort Americas, we have had cannabis customers for the last decade. Um, prior to that, I ran a company called Grodan, which we had a large percentage of our business was in the cannabis market. Um, what I have watched over the last five years is that I think that, you know, there, there's always been a cannabis is special. And I, we heard another speaker say that earlier today. And I think as, 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 long as, as soon as, as an industry, we start to say we're in indoor crop production or we're in controlled environment agriculture regardless of the plant, um, I think the industry itself will move faster and find those cross-pollinators much quicker than if we keep setting that crop aside. You know, I worked, the, the first decade of my career, I focused on floriculture. And in most floriculture facilities in the United States, growers will grow between Five and 500 varieties and a thousand varieties. And what we learn is that, you know, you might have a bedding plant in the same greenhouse that later that year you're going to have a point set up. Very different crops, very different ways to grow them, but they're both a plant that responds to the same variables. Now, how you program your growing approach or your cultivation strategy will change, but it's not going to change so drastically that one plant's different than the other. In that segment of the industry, we, there was no such thing as a poinsettia company or a geranium company. There would be a geranium grower who grew other crops, but there wasn't this idea that it was a crop that was special. And then if you look at big ag, especially as we have hemp making its way into big ag, you know, one, one year you're gonna have a strawberry grower, the next year he's gonna be a hemp grower. Then if he sold his hemp at a reasonable price, he may be a hemp grower again, but if he didn't, guess what? He's probably a blueberry grower the next year. Because those crops are extremely different, but to change, is just a matter of changing or managing different variables, but they're the same variables. And, and so I think once we get that, there will be growth in the industry that, that helps both sides, both the food or animal, ornamental producers as well as the cannabis growers. I have one more question based on that. So um, we're seeing rapid changes. Like Matt, you talked about how you changed the grow room into like a lab space now. How do people like utilities like me or other, other groups um, that are working with this industry keep up with that rapid change? There's constant consolidation, there's constant new technologies, um, there's always new customers being added, um, and you could argue that the new technologies cost more and maybe should be rebated, um, but how do we keep up with what's happening so quickly um, and make sure that we're not, let's say, investing a bunch of money in um, grow lights that may not be used as grow lights in that space um, within like a year. Well, uh, this is my opportunity for another shameless plug for the Resource Innovation Institute. Um, I think it's through organizations like that who are bringing together really smart, like-minded individuals to figure out you know, the base standards and compare it in an objective way. And I'm a real big fan of proof is in the pudding, you know, to, so to actually see it being done and then to be able to kind of compare that with others who are doing similar things to figure out the best way of doing it. Um, I'm, I'm, I, this is all I do every day, 24 seven, and I still feel like it's hard for me to keep up on it. So I wouldn't feel bad if, 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 you, if you have those same kind of apprehensions. And I would just look for those verified, trusted sources like these nonprofits, like the RII, for that, that uh, validated information. Please give the panelists another round of applause. Thank you.